we have looked at different uh, types of pneumonia. We have used uh, we have used different risk stratification tools to assess patients' risk with pneumonia and aid in determining setting of treatment. And we have also looked at causative pathogens for different types of pneumonia. Now, given a patient with community acquired pneumonia, design appropriate empiric therapy. Here are the recommendations from the 2019 ADSA guidelines for CAP. When it comes to treatment of CAP, you need to consider those patients who need to be treated as outpatient and those who need to be treated as inpatient. Let's talk about outpatient empiric treatment of CAP first. Now, for outpatient management of CAP, we are limited to oral uh, therapy. So we are limited to antibiotics that are actually available as oral therapy. The first thing we consider is that we actually uh, break patients into two groups. One group would be the healthy patients without comorbidities and these patients are less likely to have drug resistant streptococcus pneumoniae. The second group would be those with comorbidities and those comorbidities we went over uh, previously uh, basically include chronic heart, lung, liver, or renal disease, as well as diabetes, alcoholism, malignancy, or aspelinia. Now for healthy patients without those comorbidities, combination therapy is unnecessary, so we can actually give them monotherapy with a single oral antibiotic. And the drug of choice for single um, agent therapy of outpatient, uh, outpatient therapy for CAP is amoxicillin 1 gram PO TID. And remember, this is outpatient, so for these patients, we don't have a, we are, we are unlikely to have a speedum culture. So because we're not going to have a res, a susceptibility results, we actually give a high dose amoxicillin uh, in order to overcome uh, resistance in strep pneumo in case this happens to be uh, having a high MIC. Now, alternatively, if someone cannot tolerate amoxicillin because of contraindications or because of penicillin allergy, alternatively, we can use doxycycline or a macrolide. And the two macrolide options are azithromycin and clarithromycin. Now, the reason doxycycline is considered alternative is basically because of limited uh, clinical trials with doxycycline. So there are more clinical studies with amoxicillin. So the uh, efficacy of amoxicillin is uh, proven and it's uh, relatively safe. Now with macrolide, uh, it's considered uh, alternative because we are seeing an increased rate of pneumococcal resistant. Um, now if you know that in your local area the rate of resistance is less than 25%, uh, you can actually use uh, azithromycin uh, monotherapy. Now, in our area at Loma Linda University Medical Center, the rate of macrolide resistance in streptococcus pneumonia is actually more than 30%. Now, for those patients who have comorbidities because they are at increased risk of having drug-resistant strep pneumo, you don't want to use a single agent, so we use a combination agent so that uh, we have good coverage. So we have oral beta-lactam and we have macrolide as first line. And then uh, if someone cannot tolerate uh, that option, then alternatively, you can use a combination of oral beta-lactam with uh, doxycycline. And of course, your options for uh, oral beta-lactam uh, could be a low-dose amoxicillin clavulinate. So, you know, since you have uh, another agent to cover it, a low-dose will be okay. Um, and of course, you can still have the option to use a high-dose. Uh, with amoxicillin, we actually use the clavulonic acid combination in order to overcome the beta-lactamases from H. flu and Moraxella catarralis because with this patient, you're more likely to have those strains. Uh, and of course, you can also use uh, cephalosporins like cefodoxim and cefuroxim. And if you choose any of these, it has to be in combination with either azithromycin or doxycycline. Now, with these patients with comorbidities, uh, we can also have a single monotherapy, so respiratory fluoroquinolones. Respiratory fluoroquinolones uh, basically refers to fluoroquinolones that are active against streptococcus pneumoniae. Because streptococcus pneumoniae is the number one respiratory pathogen, the fluoroquinolones that have activity against it are referred to as respiratory fluoroquinolones. In other words, ciprofloxacin doesn't have activity against uh, strep pneumo, so therefore ciprofloxacin is not a respiratory fluoroquinolone. Now, this is uh, considered first line in the guideline, and it helps uh, with efficacy and uh, with uh, compliance. However, keep in mind that respiratory fluoroquinolones have a high risk of collateral damage, and there are many 
adverse effects uh, listed as a black box warning. So uh, ideally, a better option would be an oral beta-lactam plus a macrolide um, as, uh, as opposed to a single fluoro uh, respiratory fluoroquinolone because of collateral damage and the adverse effects. Now, when it comes to inpatient management of CAP, we ne basically need to identify severe and non-severe pneumonia. So basically, uh, earlier we looked at criteria for severe CAP and non-severe. So if somebody has either one of these major criteria or if they have uh, at least three of the minor criteria, they would actually have uh, severe CAP. And if they don't, they will have non-severe CAP. And the significance of severe CAP is the increased risk of mortality. So because patients are more likely to die from CAP, if they have severe CAP, you want to make sure that you have an optimal uh, regimen for those patients. Now let's take a look at non-severe uh, patients. And we're specifically looking at patients who do not have any risk factors for either MRSA or Pseudomonas. So if these patients were sick enough to be admitted to the hospital, so this is in inpatient management, uh, but not uh, basically classified as non-severe, um, you know, because patients who get uh, hospitalized, they're sick enough to uh, and often cannot tolerate oral. Uh, these agents happen to be IV initially, although if they can uh, tolerate oral, it's okay to, you know, give them oral medication. But you will see in hospital is that often the very first uh, doses of these antibiotics are given as IV. Uh, it also helps with absorption because if you give oral uh, antibiotics, it takes some time for, uh, for the antibiotic to be absorbed and uh, be available at the site of infection. So the IV antibiotics also help with that to get the antibiotic to the site of infection as fast as possible. Po possible. So you will see that uh, now we have IV beta lactams as a possibility. And because of the mortality benefit in, in patient, um, patients, uh, we use a combination. So monotherapy uh, with beta-lactam is no longer an option if someone is hospitalized. We want to uh, basically combine it with either a macrolide or doxycycline. And the reason is that, uh, you know, uh, the, probably the underlying cause is that beta-lactams don't have activity against atypical agents. So by combining the uh, beta-lactam with either uh, azithromycin or doxycycline, you also get that extra atypical um, coverage uh, and in clinical trials, or I should say in, uh, in the literature, we have seen that this combination can actually reduce mortality. So here are the IV uh, beta-lactams that are listed. Now you will see that ceftarolin is listed here and you will uh, realize that ceftarolin is actually a, a beta-lactam that's active against MRSA. However, the guidelines don't recommend using ceftarolin for MRSA coverage specifically uh, because of the lack of clinical trials in uh, MRSA pneumonia. So there hasn't been a proven efficacy of ceftarolin for MRSA pneumonia yet. So the only use of ceftarolin so far in the guideline is just, uh, just like the same thing as cef ceftriaxone. It's to cover streptococcus pneumoniae and some of those common organisms that cause pneumonia, but not MRSA. And when it comes to macrolides, we have azithromycin, uh, the only macrolide available as IV. Clarithromycin is only available as PO. Now, alternatively, we can also have monotherapy with the fluoroquinolone. So uh, either, uh, and it has to be a respiratory fluoroquinolone, either levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. So this is also considered first line. But again, keep in mind that this is associated with collateral damage and adverse effects. Um, I should also mention that the beta-lactam plus macrolide is first line, but beta-lactam plus doxycycline is considered alternatives because there is less evidence with doxycycline. Now, when it comes to severe uh, CAP, uh, we actually uh, do not use monotherapy with fluoroquinolones. So we, uh, you know, because of the increased risk of mortality, we want to make sure that we have a combination that uh, is very likely to be active against the likely causative agent. So we use a combination of beta-lactam plus macrolide or beta-lactam plus a fluoroquinolone. And both of them are considered first line. And of course, the preference will be to beta-lactam plus macrolide because of the collateral damage of fluoroquinolone. Now, doxycycline is not listed for severe, again, because of the lack of evidence with doxycycline. And we don't really want to take a chance 
with severe because of the increased risk of mortality. For those patients who have risk factors for MRSA or Pseudomonas, here are the re recommendations. So if someone actually had a history of MRSA isolation, so either from a past sputum culture or from a blood culture, if someone has a history of that, then the guidelines recommend that regardless of whether it's non-severe or severe to add MRSA coverage. And the two options that we have are IV vancomycin or linazolid, either IV or PO. You do not want to use PO vancomycin because it's not absorbed, so it will not be useful. But IV vancomycin is an excellent option. Now, they also say that since you are uh, adding MRSA coverage, it's also important to make sure that you obtain uh, culture, so speedum culture, um, as well as for MRSA nasal PCR, in order to uh, either de-escalate therapy, meaning that if you don't grow MRSA, you will basically discontinue uh, vancomycin or linazolid, or if you do actually uh, grow MRSA on the culture, of, or if the nasal PCR tests positive for MRSA, then you know that you did the right thing and you will continue therapy. So that's the same thing for either severe or non-severe. Now, when it comes to history of pseudomonas isolation, depending on what you selected uh, for your treatment of uh, pneumonia, uh, all you have to do is to make sure that you use a beta-lactam as part of your original regimen that covers uh, pseudomonas. So, for example, let's say here, if you had uh, chosen uh, ceftriaxone, if, if, you, uh, I, if, you, if your patient has a history of pseudomonas uh, isolation, instead of ceftriaxone, you would use a beta-lactam that has uh, anti-pseudomonal co uh, coverage. So either piptazo, cefepime, ceftazidime, and uh, for patients who have penicillin allergy where the reaction is anaphylaxis, we can use astreonam because astreonam uh, doesn't uh, have the same side chain as uh, the rest of uh, the beta-lactams with the exception of uh, ceftazidine, uh, as well as the core uh, is very different. So it, the chemical structure of astreonam looks very different, so it's less likely to have cross-reactivity. Now, with carbapenems, meropenem, and imipenem, because they are very broad, you should also only use them if the patient had a history of multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, meaning that if they in the past they had pseudomonas that was resistant to peptazo or cefepime or ceftazidime, uh, then uh, you know you you don't want to use those uh, same agents. So you want to use something broader like uh, meropenem. Now, it is important to obtain cultures to allow de-escalation or confirmation of, uh, for continued therapy. In other words, uh, you know, if you do not grow pseudomonas on the culture, then you can de-escalate these back to uh, ceftriaxone. Or if you did grow pseudomonas, then you know that you had made the right decision and then you will continue these uh, anti-pseudomonal coverage. Now, the same is uh, true for severe and non-severe. So this strategy is the same, it doesn't matter. If the patient has had hospitalization and IV antibiotics in the last 90 days, that's when the strategy is different between non-severe and severe. So for non-severe, you want to obtain culture and nasal PCR, but you do not want to start, um, you know, either you do not want to add MRSA coverage and you do not want to start using pseudomonal coverage unless uh, the culture results are positive. So you basically get the culture and you just wait for the results to come back. Now, if the results actually uh, you know, grow MRSA or pseudomonas, then you can add coverage for those. And if they don't, then you know that you had done the right thing. Now for severe, you don't want to do that because of the increased risk of mortality. So if uh, you, know, uh, you get the culture and uh, nasal PCR, but you actually go ahead and add the MRC coverage and uh, anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam while you wait for the results. So you, don't, you do not want to wait for the results to start these agents because of the increased risk of mortality. But for non-severe, you can actually, uh, you know, kind of uh, take a watchful strategy. So, you know, as long as the patient is stable and improving, you just wait for the culture results to come back, but you do uh, you know, start antibodies for the usual uh, pathogen. So you do start your ceftriaxone uh, and azithromycin if you need to. Now, from an antimicrobial stewardship uh, standpoint, it is important to de-escalate, you know, for those patients that we added MRSA coverage and anti-pseudomonal, 
uh, you know, in general, if after 48 hours, uh, nothing has grown as far as MRSA and Pseudomonas, it is uh, safe to de-escalate, meaning that you can uh, discontinue MRSA coverage and you can change the anti-pseudomonal agent to something narrower uh, because uh, that has been shown to be safe and it reduces duration of antibiotic th treatment, length of hospitalization and complications of broad spectrum therapy, specifically collateral damage. And lastly, the 2019 IDSA guidelines for the very first time had recommendations for aspiration pneumonia. And what they say is that they don't suggest rut routinely adding anaerobic coverage for suspected aspiration pneumonia unless the patient uh, actually has a lung abscess or empyema. So lung abscess and empyema are more likely to actually grow anaerobic organisms. Uh, so outside of that, it's very unlikely that the patient will have anaerobic um, organisms uh, growing, so it's not recommended to add uh, uh, metronidazole, uh, for example. Now, for those who actually have lung abscess or empyema who need anaerobic uh, coverage, uh, you know, if, you, if you're, uh, the regimen that you're using actually covers anaerobic, it's fine. So if something like ampicillin salt bactam, uh, you know, alone is, is enough because it has anaerobic coverage. Uh, now, if you're using something like uh, cefepime or ceftriaxone, which does not have great anaerobic activity, then you can add clindamycin to it. Uh, and, you know, uh, a lot of uh, studies actually have shown that clindamycin is superior to metronidazole. Uh, so if you have the option, you want to use clindamycin over uh, metronidazole. But the key point is that for the most part, aspiration pneumonia does not need anaerobic coverage.